This video will cover classical measurement error in regression analysis and the attenuation bias that results from it. At the end of this video, you should feel comfortable explaining what it means to have measurement error in an independent variable, identifying models where measurement error might be present, and explaining how measurement error will affect the results of an OLS model. It is sometimes hypothesized that homeowners spend more money when the values of their homes increase. Why might this be true? Many homeowners have a significant portion of their wealth in their home, so a higher, so higher home prices could induce a so-called wealth effect that increases consumption. Similarly, higher home values could increase access to credit, such as home equity loans. Why might we be interested in measuring this wealth effect? It would help us understand how changes in the housing market might affect other areas of the economy. So, if we want to know whether this wealth effect really exists, and if so, how strong it is, what should we do? A simple answer would be to find the relationship between consumption and house price. Analyses of this question have used econometric models similar to this one, although they are often more complex. It is common to use a double log model, perhaps due to the many outliers of consumption and house prices. This also lets us interpret the coefficient as an elasticity. Research on the wealth effect frequently uses data from surveys. However, one study from the Central Bank of Ireland uses two different data sources for house prices surveys, and administrative records for mortgages. They estimate a model similar to the one here twice, once with survey data and once with the administrative data. When using survey data for house prices, they estimate beta 1 to be 0 0.038. This suggests that a 1% increase in house price is associated with a 0.038% increase in consumption. This sounds like a fairly small wealth effect, and in fact the p-value associated with the coefficient estimate is 0 0.085, so the 5 at the 5% significance level, we would fail to reject that there is no wealth effect at all. What happens when we switch to administrative data on house prices? The estimated beta 1 becomes 0 0.134. Although this estimate is still smaller than some other studies using different data or different methods, the estimated effect is now 3.5 times as large simply by using administrative data instead of survey data, and the small p-value indicates high confidence in a relationship. Why the discrepancy between the results? Which one do you trust more? The answer lies in the quality of the data. While we would think that administrative records on mortgages would be quite accurate, it would not be surprising if individuals responding to a survey had trouble recalling the exact price of their home. In fact, surveys often encourage respondents to take their best guess if they are uncertain. We refer to this problem as measurement error when it applies to a variable in a regression analysis. The effects of measurement error on a model's results can be severe, as we've seen in this example. Let's introduce some notation so that we can discuss measurement error clearly. We'd like to estimate a true model where y is a dependent variable and x is the independent variable but we can't estimate this because our data set contains only error-prone variables, not the true x and y. The error-prone independent variable is called x tilde, which is x plus some random error w. That w is the measurement error. We'll also consider measurement error in the dependent variable. Although it's possible for the measurement error w to take on a variety of forms, we'll make a simplifying assumption that the measurement error terms are distributed independently and have a normal distribution with mean zero. When this is true, we call the issue classical measurement error. To better understand how classical measurement error affects a model's results, let's consider a simulation. We can use, easily use statistical software to generate a series of x and y observations according to a data generating process. y equals 2 plus 3x plus u where u is a normally distributed random error. Here is a simulated data set that follows this data generating process. The graph also shows a line representing the population relationship. We know this because we generated the data according to this relationship. The best fit line matches a population relationship quite closely as we might expect. In fact, the OLS prediction nearly overlaps the population relationship. What happens when we replace the original x with an error-prone version of x. Here is that same graph, except that we use x tilde, the original x plus measurement error. Notice that the points have been shifted randomly in the horizontal direction, and in the process, the best fit line 
has become much less steep. Take a moment to convince yourself that going from the original x to the error-prone x results in a shallower slope. You might imagine that the more measurement error in x, the shallower the slope will get. We call the result attenuation bias. Attenuation refers to the fact that the slope gets attenuated or biased towards zero. Sometimes this is also called errors in variables bias. That name refers to the underlying problem of measurement error rather than describing the direction of the resulting bias. Let's go back to the original independent variable and now consider what happens if measurement error is introduced into the dependent variable. Here is the same graph except that we use y tilde, the original y plus measurement error. Notice that the points have been shifted randomly in the vertical direction. However, the OLS best fit line is still quite close to the population relationship. Take a moment, again, to convince yourself that going from the original data to the error prone y does not appear to result in a biased slope estimate as we saw with an error prone x. We could also confirm this by comparing the slope estimates when we estimate a regression of y on x or replace x and y with their error prone measurements. Here are the estimated beta 1 coefficients and their associated standard errors in parentheses from our simulated data set. Remember that we are expecting to see a slope near 3 because that is the population value. The true values of x and y give us an estimate very close to 3 and a relatively small standard error. Replacing x with the error prone measurement x tilde reduces the coefficient estimate to a fraction of the population parameter 3 consistent with attenuation bias. The standard error also increases, which we might expect given that we are introducing a new type of error. If we use an error prone y but the original x, the coefficient estimate is again quite close to 3, consistent with the most recent graph showing no attenuation bias. However, the standard error remains higher. If we have measurement error in both variables, we again see attenuation bias along with a higher standard error. So our simulation suggests the following bottom line. Measurement error in an independent variable leads to attenuation bias, that is, bias towards zero, in the coefficient on that variable. We do not see the same effect for measurement error in the dependent variable, although that does increase standard errors on coefficients. Let's put some algebra behind the patterns we're seeing. Let's start with the model we'd like to estimate and also the definition of the error-prone independent variable x tilde. We'll assume for now that we have an accurate measure of y. So we're stuck estimating a model with the error-prone x. What does that mean we'll get when we estimate the slope beta 1? Recall the formula for the OLS slope estimator, which divides the covariance of the independent and dependent variable by the variance of the independent variable. Let's plug in a few things to see what we get. We can replace x tilde using its definition with x plus w. Similarly, we can replace y using the true model with beta 0 plus beta 1x plus u. How can we simplify this covariance? It turns out that in expectation, this expression simplifies nicely. To see this, recall that we can compute the covariance by considering each combination of terms. The covariance of x and beta 0, a constant, is 0. The covariance of x and beta 1x simplifies to beta 1 times the variance of x. This is the only non-zero term in our covariance expression. The covariance of x and u, the random model error term, is expected to be 0 on average. Finally, the covariance of w, the random measurement error term, and any of the remaining terms is also 0 on average. We'll end by rewriting the final expression slightly, using sigma to denote standard deviations and therefore sigma squared to represent variances. Now let's clear the clutter and focus on the final expression. It says that in expectation, or on average, we should expect our slope estimates beta 1 to equal the actual value of beta 1 times a fraction. Take a careful look at that fraction. Each of the variances is always positive, and as long as sigma w squared is not zero, meaning there is some measurement error, the fraction is less than one. 
So the estimated beta 1 tends to be the true beta 1 times a fraction less than 1. This is consistent with our simulation that found the estimated slope was attenuated in the presence of measurement error in the independent variable. The fraction tells us just how much the slope is attenuated. It may be worth noting, for example, that the greater the variance of the measurement error term, the smaller this fraction, that is, the more the slope is attenuated. Perhaps less obvious is that the greater the variance of the independent variable, the smaller this fraction, at least if the variance of the measurement error is unaffected. More broadly, attenuation is more severe when the variance of the measurement error is large compared with the variance of the independent variable that is measured with error. Finally, we could write an expression for the bias, that is, how much the estimated beta 1 differs on average from the true beta 1. The negative beta 1 reminds us that the bias is always towards zero. Positive slopes will get smaller, while negative slopes will get more positive, which is also smaller in magnitude. The fraction again reminds us that the bias is greater when the measurement error is large compared to the scale of the variable itself. We've been focusing on measurement error in the independent variable. Let's take a moment to see why measurement error in the dependent variable didn't actually cause bias. Here's the same setup, except that we now replace y with y tilde in our estimation. We can substitute the definition of y tilde, then note that the random measurement error w can be subtracted from both sides of the equation. The only real difference is that the model's error term now combines the original econometric error term u and the measurement error w, although this generally increases the magnitude of the model's error terms and therefore decreases the precision of our estimates, it doesn't introduce any new form of bias as long as w follows the assumptions of classical measurement error. Let's now try an exercise by returning to the example we started with, where researchers regress the natural log of a household's consumption on the natural log of the house price. Researchers got two different estimates of beta 1, depending on whether they use survey data or administrative data for house prices. Assuming for now that the difference is due to classical measurement error, use the attenuation bias formula to answer the following two questions. First, what do the findings tell you about the fraction involving sigma x squared and sigma w squared in the formula? Second, how do you expect the estimates of beta 1 to change if consumption were measured by administrative data instead of a survey? You may wish to take a moment to pause the video while you work out the answers. Let's start with the first question. We'll need to think carefully about what each term in the attenuation bias formula means. The first term is the expected value of the estimated beta 1 when we have an independent variable measured with error. We don't know for sure what this expected value is because we haven't estimated beta 1 over many samples, but we do have one estimate of beta 1 using an error-prone independent variable. That estimate comes from survey data. So our best guess at this expected value is the 0.038 estimate from the survey data. The next term is the population parameter beta 1. We also don't know this value for sure, but our best guess at this is an estimate that is not subject to attenuation bias. Assuming the administrative data are accurate, the second estimate of beta 1 should fit the bill. The remaining part of the formula is the fraction we're interested in, so we can approximate that fraction by comparing our two estimates. We find that the fraction is about 0.28. Think for a moment about what this means. Sigma w squared must be quite large compared to sigma x squared to get a fraction this much less than 1. A large sigma w squared means a large measurement error in house prices. In fact, the, typ the typical reporting errors indicated by sigma w appear to be large compared to the variation in house prices across the sample indicated by sigma x. It's rather surprising that the reporting errors would be so large. The, the authors of this paper point out that there may be other reasons the survey data produces biased results but nonetheless, the discrepancy suggests that the survey data on house prices may be subject to very substantial measurement errors. Let's now turn to the second question. If it were possible to measure consumption using administrative data instead of survey data, we would presumably get more accurate information. However, household consumption is the model's dependent variable, and we saw that classical measurement error in the dependent variable does not cause bias. So, using more accurately measured consumption might reduce the standard errors of the estimates of beta 1 
but we should not expect our estimates to change substantially in either direction.